Wizards, welcome back. I'm really excited for today's video and sharing all this with you because in kind of learning and researching all this stuff about layering systems, it really broke a lot of the misconceptions that I think a lot of the marketing, you know, the marketing departments of all these clothing companies are really trying to push. And instead I learned what you really actually have to have, like those few key items. And a lot of the other things you can piece together yourself so you don't waste a ton of money on like stupid ass items like a five in one system from Cabela's. Today we'll be talking about cold weather layering for the prepared citizen and how to survive and maintain in that environment. I have like a billion individual pieces to show you. So let's transition down to the basement where I can get access to everything. Ah, this is a ton better. And I have like a million pieces of clothing to show you. So now I don't have to race in and out just to get everything. Now I want to give you kind of a preface. We're going to be looking at all the clothing, everything from a prepared citizen mindset, like thinking that you're out there and active and doing things and being an active participant and very likely having a plate carrier on. Just not standing around punches some pretty big holes into some other layering concepts. I'll explain it all to you, but first let's take a moment and thank today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by HRT Tactical Gear. HRT continually pushes the standard in terms of tactical gear and training with the modular AWLS Lite that gives you two head options for that CQB or long distance throw, along with the ARC belt with smart medical, tool, and mag attachment pouches. The arc belt that I have is also the only one that I think has just one whole family of products on it, just because that whole arc suite just plays so well together. But if you want to pick up any of the other HRT items, including the AWS or any of their belt stuff, make sure to use discount code TLDCO over at the HRT website. So big thanks to HRT. Now, normally this is the part of the video where I go over my biases, but there's so much stuff that will take up the entire video. And to be honest, I don't remember where most of the stuff came from. It's kind of interesting as we go into biases because I may have a bias towards these products and I'm gonna show you a lot of different things. But as we go into layering, it becomes very specific to the individual and what you're doing. So there isn't really any product that's like, oh, this one's the magic one. You just buy this one. That doesn't really exist. And it's I think why you kind of see some guys just start to ramble when you ask them what's the best gear to buy because everything like that you need really depends on three key things. And I refer to those as Abe, your activity level, your body, and your environment. Like, I don't like multiple pant layers. I tend to overheat pretty quickly when I do that, but I also know that my hands get cold very quickly whenever I stop moving. And that's a body knowledge of myself. And if we're out chopping trees or just glassing doing recon, well, those are very different levels of activity and the environment may play a huge role at those activity levels in terms of what clothes we're bringing. Just get the idea of the right clothes out of your mind and instead think of more what is the correct combination of clothes to effectively manage sweat based on your activity and your environment. It sounds a little bit funny and we'll definitely get into it as we move through everything, but sweat management is like the entire theme. If you find that you're just warm and cozy, you're probably doing it wrong. I'm just saying there's been a lot of commercialization and overcomplication of clothing options. Like guys who sell clothes tell you there's no bad weather, only bad clothing. People who say that, I, I will say the majority of them have a very vested interest in you buying something. Realistically though, knowledge of your body and your environment are what matters. The clothes don't matter at all, like realistically, if you don't have those two things. Take this analogy, for example. Like if you had one guy totally unskilled in firearms, but you gave him the best platform you had, but a second guy who is very skilled in firearms, but gave him a total trash platform. Well, the skilled guy with the junk platform is likely gonna win every time. And here's the same idea. Being unskilled in your body and your environment makes the coolest clothes or the coolest rifle in that analogy kind of pointless. Now I found this really interesting though, because Sean, who is a E9 SEER instructor, doesn't prescribe to any of the layer three or layer seven stuff pretty much at all. It was very interesting when I was talking to him trying to learn more about you know the layering and everything else. And he was like, well, the three layer and the seven layer stuff, those are great for somebody who wants to go outside for like 12 hours. In teaching a lot of survival classes, he would see this, this over commercialization in a lot of his students 
where they would show up and want to be warm and cozy. And these students would rely kind of on the performance of the clothing themselves to make up for their lack of skill and how to use it. But in a survival scenario, he taught that being warm means it's easy to overheat and cause all sorts of other problems. So let me backtrack a little bit. Let's explain the three layer system. I'll explain how it kind of mirrors over and just makes the seven layer system a little more, a little more complicated. And then we'll look at things in a seer and survival approach for a, a much more usable and applicable system that I think you guys are gonna like a lot more. There's definitely some similarities between them all, but I gotta explain the egg before we can crack it open and serve it in a much better way. Mainly though, seven layer, well, it's just a cool way to sell clothes to the government at ridiculously insane prices. I mean, yeah, outdoor research, it's totally normal to sell the government six or $800 pants. It's totally not a garbage move and you're, you're not fleecing the government and taxpayers at all. Getting started though, in the three layer system, you have obviously three different layers, a base layer, a mid layer, and an outer layer. Your base layer sits directly against the skin and the main purpose of this is to wick moisture away from the body. Now, wet skin is like the devil. It's pretty much what we're trying to avoid in all these systems at all costs. And it's why cotton clothes or cotton apparel is so bad when you wanna do anything in a survival or layering system. Here in Nebraska, like a million times, I'll just have on like a regular uh, cool guy cotton shirt and then I'll throw on like a Gore-Tex or something and go shovel snow. But the moment I stop shoveling because all that moisture has accumulated on, on my cotton shirts and I'm just completely soaked underneath with no way for it to evaporate, my body temps just instantly sink. So kind of a good takeaway, someone wearing cotton is a pretty key indicator that they don't know what they're doing. And in a survival or prepared citizen or just a mission where we have to go out into the cold, someone wearing cotton is a liability, mostly because they're a moron. So yeah, while we all like our cool guy wizard shirts or operational whatever, in any sort of realistic application, these cotton shirts would immediately go because they would be the worst thing possible. Now the next layer in our three layer system is the mid layer. This layer is designed to trap and retain body heat while still allowing that moisture to be expelled from the layer underneath. The mid layer is where you can get like, you know, when people try to explain the layering system is where you can get a lot of vagueness because you really do have a lot of options here between like a light fleece, a heavy fleece, uh, you know, like a down jacket or something like that. So in the mid layer, you have a lot of options and how you can mix things up. One warning, and I think kind of a misstep some people will do talking more with Sean in the survival aspect of things, is you gotta be careful when adding multiple mid layers because you're gonna actually trap more heat underneath than that fabric originally did when you first use it and it could make you overheat now that you're doing a different combination that you may not have played with before. As you're gonna see more and more, the goal is to be chilly. And that's pretty difficult to do when you have on like a base layer, and then two mid layers, and then possibly a jacket on over that. The final layer is the outer layer, which has the purpose of protecting you from the elements. Think wind, rain, snow. The outer layer should allow moisture to escape from underneath, but prevent water and wind from getting in. Think of that layer three as like your protective shell from the outside environment. Now something we're starting to see here also, or, or kind of leaning into, is knowledge of the weather and the environment you're gonna be going into is just as key as the clothes you brought. Because if there's no rain or wind and your friend spends the whole trip in their $700 hard shell jacket, well, they could be an idiot. As we noted, you're also seeing how pushing moisture from the skin and out is one constant on every single layer. It's more pivotal the closer it is to the skin but that moisture removal continues all the way out into the outer layers, followed by that insulation and that waterproof, you know, weather protection layer as we move further outward as kind of the important things we're trying to accomplish. Now, as I said, there's also a seven layer system that is a little bit still more overcomplicated and more over commercialized than this already kind of overcomplicated system. I mean, it does provide you with more flexibility of options, but I just want you to know that it's really just designed to sell large quantities of product to the military. 
And this seven layer system, the premise is the same with moisture management, insulation, and weather protection, but it's broken down a bit further. One and two are your base layer in the three layer system. The one being lightweight base layers and two being mid or heavyweight layers. We'll talk about this a little bit, but level one is pretty much always a must. And level two is really dependent on that Abe we talked about earlier, that activity level, body and environment. I have no idea if the words are actually here and I'm just pointing to nothing. I just wanna say that now because if you're out there shopping, I want you to realize that having a heavyweight base layer is not gonna be as versatile as just a layer one, just that thin, the thinnest possible base layer you can get. That's probably the best one because it's gonna be useful across so many more situations than a more heavyweight base layer is gonna be. So layers three, four, and five just break out the insulation layer into finer detail, but I'm sure you can figure this out. Uh, the lighter fleece goes first in layer three, then heavier fleece or synthetic jackets in layer four, and a soft shell to give you some breathable wind resistance in layer five. So you're seeing the same stuff that we talked about in the three layer system, but it's more broken down so that the military can order layer five or layer three and just not accidentally order a ton of lightweight fleeces that they didn't need. Does that happen still? Yeah, absolutely, and all the time. For you or I, I think the seven layer system really isn't all that great, mainly because we have the ability to mix and match. We're not stuck to certain patterns that you have to wear in certain uniforms and certain colors. So you can build a lot more of what's perfect for your body and what's perfect for your body based on what you're doing and where you're doing it. Layers six and seven mimic the outer layer in the three layer system as the weather protection layers. Layer six being that hard shell jacket and pants and layer seven being a heavy insulated parka or jacket. Like layer seven provides that max level of warmth and it's designed to be used when you're in that extreme cold and your activity level is almost zero. So think of level seven as like checking IDs or guarding a tree stump not really ideal for that active prepared citizen, but I wanna give you the whole premise of it all. Now I'm gonna take a second, I'm gonna go grab a couple products so I can show you each one in each of the different tiers that I like. Now though, I wanna remind you, don't really focus on the product itself. Focus on the why, so then you know what to shop for and the pieces you wanna get, like the important features, when you put together your own mix for your body and your activity and everything else you're doing. I'll also reference everything in both the three layer and the seven layer system so you can have a little bit more granularity in, in how you want to put it all together. So first, let me go get them. Let's start with our base layers. On this layer, I have two things, a merino wool from QU, I hope that's how it's said, and a synthetic from Beyond Systems. And you're going to constantly hear the comparison between wool and synthetic. And yeah, there are some differences. Now with your wools, they're going to be more antimicrobial but less durable, like these are really easy to tear and they are a complete pain to wash. Synthetics, on the other hand, don't have a lot of those antimicrobial properties so they can get a lot more stinky, but they are a ton more durable and they can be washed like most of your regular clothing. But that's not my key takeaway. They just manage moisture differently. The wool is hydrophilic, meaning it draws in moisture like a sponge the moisture layer traps heat and also evaporates to keep you cool. Synthetics, on the other hand, are hydrophobic, meaning they repel water and push it to the outer layers to keep your skin dry. So one is kind of drawing in moisture and the other one is kind of repelling it. Now, there are also some hybrids you can get of these where they have like an interwoven fabric and that gets to be pretty confusing when you have the two different materials doing kind of opposing things like the interwoven fabrics, that doesn't make any sense to me. I did see one hybrid from First Spear that's like a synthetic on the body and a wool on the outside, which is nice, but it's also got the cons of both fabrics. So yeah, I'm still pretty meh on that and pretty meh on hybrids overall. Now, most people who are getting started in this are gonna ask them, okay, I, I wanna get started with my base layer. Which one is correct? And as with everything else, which is the correct choice is based off of your body, your activity level and your environment. So it's not an easy question to answer. So as we're at that first layer, the base of everything, 
I really do recommend that you get both, a really good synthetic layer and a really good merino wool, because then you can play with it on how your body reacts in different environments and different activity levels, and then have choices based off how those change to build the core of any system you want to. You also have that layer two or the heavy base layer. And for that, I have the Oslo and the DM base layer. These guys are thicker and are designed to complement the layer underneath by adding more insulation, but also work to wick that moisture from underneath. See, I told you being inside is gonna be better because I have to get a million different things. Now, the survival guys are also gonna tell you that this is good to add to a level one base layer and not necessarily use a, you know, a thicker, heavier weight base layer instead of your level one. And kind of why I said having the layer one thinner stuff is what I recommend you buy because it's just gonna be more versatile overall. Here the DM base layer uses a Polar Tech grid pattern to make air gaps to trap heat, but also draw moisture. And the Oslo uses different fabric types to have heat retention and heat repulsion based on different heat areas. Now I think both of these are great, but just remember that your core one base layer is never gonna come off. So for you to need a layer two base layer, your environment's gonna have to be pretty extreme and your activity level is gonna have to be pretty low. Like for me, I'd have to be just sitting static in a tree stand and have to be like 15 degrees or cooler for me to consider having a base layer one and a base layer two. But also I'm a guy from Nebraska who's used to the cold and it's really why I say that whole body part really comes into play as to everything you're gonna pick and everything you're gonna use. As a light mid layer or layer three, I have a DM Nexus pullover, a QU heavyweight flannel, and a Beyond Systems cold weather combat shirt. All these offering lightweight insulation with the Nexus continuing that Polar Tech Wind Pro to cut the weather just a bit. The Nexus does also have a nice front kangaroo pocket you can slip your hands in to keep your hands warm. That'll come more into play when we go to talk about gloves. And that was really interesting, the guidance I was given from a seer and survival perspective, because it was really contrary to everything I've known. We'll, we'll do it at the end, trust me, it's pretty awesome. Now, I also don't generally recommend combat shirts, particularly in the layering system, because they're oftentimes doing two different things. Like you could have one, you know, heavyweight layer on the arms and then like a wicking layer on the chest and that may get confusing as you start to layer things together without having one unified layer doing just one unified system. This Beyond Cold Weather version is a bit different as it's a lightweight fleece and a soft shell for the arms. It's still blending layers four and six and could get confusing based on what you added. Like I said, I'll kind of give you that overview basics and then we'll give you that easier sear perspective on everything. Now, I think you also saw that I used just a basic lightweight flannel and this is showing you you can use a lot of stuff you already have. I mean, this is a pretty heavyweight QU. It's really, really nice. But as long as you're not using cotton, you're, you're probably doing just fine and putting your layering system together. At this tier, it really doesn't have to be fancy, just effective in holding in some insulation and blocking some wind. And I would say for me personally, uh, like a layer one and a layer three would be in like that 35 to 45 degrees and relatively low to almost no activity. Looking at a thicker mid layer or layer four, we see our heavier fleece like with our triple aught design Ranger LT and the Helion jacket from Defense Mechanisms. The Helion to me is one of my favorites because it has the side panels that expel excess heat and really works great in a layering system when you need to actually do something and be active, particularly with a plate carrier on. The Ranger LT is a more ruggedized thick fleece that doesn't work quite as well with a plate carrier, but you could unzip it if you got too hot and expel some heat that way. A thicker fleece like this Ranger LT or the Helion jacket it's something I would probably wear in like temps of, you know, 25 to 30 with a level one base layer with relatively low activity level. And then when the activity may, may ramp up and you warm up, I may shed this layer four if I need to, to expel some of that warmth or just kind of count on some of these ventilation areas to be able to expel some heat if I needed to do that. For our last mid layer or layer five, it's our soft shell materials. For this, I use a massive style as it offers you a lot more protection from the elements while still staying breathable. 
but we're starting to get pretty pricey at this point. And I think a lot of people make, including myself, is when you're looking at different layers, you look at the price and you assume, oh, that super, super expensive one. Oh, that's the layer that's the most important. That's the one that I need to get. I'll just get that one thing for now. When in reality, it's not based off price at all. It's based off your body, what you're doing and where you're doing it. So think more along those lines instead of looking at price tags. I mean, maybe if you know the tier, like you want to get a soft shell or a hard shell jacket, you know, seeing a more expensive version of that may be like, hey, I'm going to get some extra features with this. But just looking at it from a broad spectrum, the higher price doesn't really tell you anything. Clothing sellers are probably gonna hate me and that's probably a good thing. Plus you can find a lot of massive stuff at mostly at, at surplus stores too. So the only people that should be playing full price on massive gear is pretty much the military anyway. So yeah, enough of that. But I will say the soft shell is great for cutting out wind while still being breathable in rough terrain or high output activities like stalking. Kind of like what I said for my body, I just use soft shell pants and I don't really even use a base layer. Even when I'm out in super cold and in the snow, this is just what keeps me comfortable. And it's important to know your body for that. Now though, QU attack pants are probably a better, less expensive option that does just about everything. I think when I worked my poo poo job that I even wore these for business casual. They, they, do, they do just about everything. I will say for temperature reference, my soft shells are for like, I don't know, 10 to 20 degrees when there's a whole lot of snow or moisture out there and I don't want that moisture to get to my clothing layers underneath. This is pretty much when I would use a soft shell. I'd even say for me, a soft shell and a really good base layer is probably my favorite combo, just those two, because you can stay really active in that and also not overheat. Our outer layer or layer six is mostly waterproof protection. And here I use a hard shell Gore-Tex style. Now I want you to think of this as like downpour level rain or snow, and you just absolutely have to be protected from it in order to stay warm. I'll even say that this is the second bit of gear that I think, you know, on top of that layer one, that is absolutely required gear because it's going to rain or it's going to snow and your body temp dropping from soaking up water and all that will be a huge problem from a survival aspect if you don't have something like this. Gore-Tex pants and jackets are easy to throw in a pack and then toss over your plate carrier or over your boots in a hurry if you need to stay dry. So take home tips. Number one, good ass base layer in both synthetic and in wool. Number two, make sure you have a really good waterproof layer so that your body temps don't drop when you get wet. The mid tiers, you can mostly mix together and slop something together that's gonna work just as long as it's not cotton. Oh yeah, number, number three is probably have waterproof socks, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. The final outer layer is our extreme cold protection or layer seven. This is like a heavy insulated parka from Adi Gear, the super secret DM parka, or something totally nuts, but extremely warm like this wild coat. As we're looking at layering, we're looking at it from the lens of a prepared citizen. And as we look at it that way, I'm assuming that you're gonna be active in some way. And layer seven is really for that extreme cold and the you know, almost no level activity or really, really low levels of activity that you're actually putting out. But if we're climbing a high ridge to glass over a hill for a few hours, then yeah, you may throw on a super heavy parka after we've cooled off for a bit. But level seven is less needed than you'd think, unless you're in like sustained below zero temps or have a very small window before frostbite sets in. Now, I also want to show you gloves and hats and all that, but it leads me into, you know, talking about that whole better sear mindset first. I just wanted you to see some of the different clothes at the different tiers and kind of how, you know, you can be upsold on different things that you may not exactly need. And the truly pivotal stuff is like layer one and then throw layer six in a bag because you can figure out the rest of it yourself. So let's put all this away for now and let's get into the sear kind of a sear smart level way of thinking about clothing and layering systems instead of how like commercial and, and marketing companies want us to think about layering systems. Now, again, Sean explained this kind of this concept to me and a lot of it made sense. And being a chief at the Sears schoolhouse, 
well, he's seen a lot more students and a lot more realistic examples than, than probably me or you have. And when I kind of asked him about what his thoughts were about the three layer and the seven layer system, he kind of laughed at me and he was like, well, all that stuff is just commercialization. It's just, it's just marketing. And it's really good for that guy who's never been outside, wants to go outside for his first time and be nice and warm and cozy for his 12 hour trek that he, he planned on Google. As military, survival and evasion and prepared citizens are gonna be very active, it changes the game completely. Sean had some core principles when it comes to layering. One, layering means nothing if you're not paying attention to your weather and your activity level. You could get in trouble very quickly, even with the most expensive cool guy stuff you could possibly have, if you don't pay attention to those two things. Number two, know how to control your heat points. Groin, armpits, crotch. Prioritize the ability to retain and expel heat with systems like pit zips, hoods, and leg and rear pocket zippers to control your body heat. In the sear and survival world, layering is more a mindset. Like they really want you to be comfortable with being chilly. Don't, don't start your day, like the very beginning, being warm and cozy. Sean was telling me these stories like just endlessly about these guys who would come out of their tents in the morning and just be all bundled up and talking about how warm and cozy they are. And then like a hundred feet up the hill, everybody's gotta stop because these guys are completely on fire because they're all overheating. So the last main point, three, know your body, but slightly chilly is the game. You can regulate your body temp through your activity level. Walk faster, slower, vent clothing. Use the chill as a motivator to get work done. So instead of having these fancy and expensive Cabela's nonsense, uh, you know, as what's keeping you warm, you're using the activity to give you that heat source, you know what I mean? And that's gonna be way more realistic when you're already doing patrols or other things out there in the environment already. And those seven layer systems, you know, while they are a little bit overcomplicated, they also involve having a supply chain. So when you're like, hey, I built this seven layer system. Well, unless you have that supply chain behind you, now that system is unsustainable. Like if one of your pieces got torn, you need to replace it. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense to make a whole clothing system that you also can't sustain, you know, it's make an unsustainable system. That doesn't make sense. So I was like, okay, Sean, I, I get it. I get it. It's all overcomplicated and it's all over commercialized. So what do you use? And he's like, well, I use two plus three or two plus four. And I was like, what the hell is that? So here, two plus three and two plus four, it starts with the basic two, base and mid. The base layers as before, nothing changes, merino and synthetic here are key. The next is the mid layer. This is an insulating layer with slight wind and rain protection. It doesn't have to be waterproof and you're seeing this is kind of the same, you know, layer one and layer two from, from the layer three system. Um, but I will say with his mantra, when you're looking at gear, prioritize pit zips, um, and ways for heat to escape the body, like on the QU attack pants, how you can zip the sides and let out excess heat from the crotch area. This is where you can really mix and match too between like a light fleece or heavier synthetic or a heavy fleece to kind of match your environment and your activity level that you have planned for the day. For me, this is where I feel DM shines as I can take a Beyond or QU base and add in the heavier Helion or the lighter Nexus and still have an active, breathable outer layer option. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you may be inclined to combine those layers, but Sean, I was kind of surprised with this, actually advised against that because then your layer underneath is now trapping more heat and that could overheat you easier than if you just pick the correct outer layer that you needed for the day. Some of the layering stuff doesn't necessarily apply to us because you're often gonna put a plate cure on over top of that also. So, Think more of the smarter, you know, the base and then that mid that you're gonna need for the day. And then if you need to get warmer, that's where you use the plus three to add some extra insulation. Here, plus three means something changed, either your environment or your activity. The key is or. If the activity level goes down or your environment temps go down, you throw on your level three over your current setup. This is where you wanna create dead space to retain body heat, 
Synthetic parkas like the Audi and DM parka work great because they can easily pack down and then still give you a ton of insulation. Having that layer be packable is like an absolute must, but remember when you're out there with it, don't put on that layer three too quickly. You could already be warm from an activity and then be like, okay, jacket time, I'm done working. No, you wouldn't wanna do that because you're actually already warm and you could overheat when you put that layer three on. Remember, chili is the game. So make sure there's a bit of that delay so that you can expel some of that body heat and you don't overheat once you add in some extra insulation. Now on the other flip side of plus three, instead of your activity level going down, the environment could change where there's now there's rain or other environments like snow and you need to put on that waterproof layer and same as doing it with your insulating layer, you put your waterproof layer just over your plate here, over everything else to protect you from the elements. So you don't necessarily need some extra insulation from your activity level going down, but you do need some extra protection from the environment. Now, as I said, it's two plus three and two plus four. So what the heck is plus four? Plus four is when your activity level goes down and your environment is more severe. Here is where you add that insulating layer and that same waterproof layer on the outside to protect you from weather and trap in heat. This more survival and outdoor approach shows why knowing environment and your body are so important and why just having some three-in-one jacket is, that's kind of stupid. It's also interesting because Sean echoes the same thing in his mindset that those base layers and those waterproof layers are just absolutely pivotal. And the rest of it, you know, with all the other things you have in your house, the other layers of clothing that you have, you, you can probably work that out. Now, this is a very interesting one. Let's talk gloves and hats. I know it's gonna be a bit of a long video, but here things get interesting and a bit unconventional. I was always a believer in gloves, but my hands always froze. I've tried an insulating glove and a one size up glove to keep everything insulated. Then I saw these badass glomit gloves from QU and I thought I saw the perfect answer. I showed these to Sean and I was super excited and he kind of laughed at me and he was like, well, sh waterproof or not, you're gonna have a problem. He said, you're either gonna have a glove that gets colder as you're out in the environment, you know, if it's not waterproof, or you're gonna have a hand that's just wet with moisture if you have it inside a waterproof glove from just sweating through it all day. The result of both those situations are the same, which is interesting too, which is cold, wet hands. And he kind of asked me, he goes, and Walsh, what do people do with cold, wet hands? Like, you know what they do? You know, I've seen people do every single time. They put their cold, wet hands in front of a fire to dry them out. And this results in what Seer Guy calls fam hands, because this is the mistake trainees make during survival familiarization and constant exposure to wet, cold gloves and hot, dry fire results in extremely painful cracked hands. So Sean kind of from a survival aspect and even Jesse over at DM tells me that they actually use hand warmers like this QU one that, I, that I'm playing with now, where you keep your hand dexterity while also keeping your hands warm and dry. Now though, I will say some environment can come into play with this as you know, Jesse brought up, he was in Alaska where you had to wear contact gloves to even touch anything with metal instead of burning you. So yeah, that does come into play and you may have to adjust for your environment when things get pretty extreme also. But like this QU Glacier hand warmer, this is perfect. I have a spot for hand warmers and they don't keep your hands compressed. So you could just put your hands in here to stay warm whenever you're not active. I asked Sean kind of how he uses these and what he said is he takes a hand warmer and he kind of moves it behind him whenever he's working on something so he can just put his hands behind him to warm his hands if he needs to. Otherwise, if he's not actively working on something, he'll move it back to the front and just kind of keep his hands in front to keep them warm the entire time. Now, I have seen some uh, kind of doofy videos that said they don't use hand warmers because it's just one more thing to keep track of. If the packaging from the hand warmers is what's keeping you from using them, I don't know what kind of brain damage you have or what you wanna suffer through for the rest of the day. Just throw the package away at base camp when you leave. I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's not that difficult. But overall, I did find it very interesting that from a sear approach that they don't regularly use gloves. Like they'll use them here and there, but it, it won't be the main way because you know once your hand temperature drops down, 
there's no way for a glove to warm them back up. And that's why the hand warmers are so pivotal. And they really just wanna keep all their hand dexterity they can possibly have even out in the cold. Hats can also play a big part in warmth, keeping your head warm in the morning or knocking it back to release some heat as you move up a hill. Again, remember your heat points as your, as your head is a you know, great place to retain or expel heat to cool off or warm the body. And some of your bump helmets may have vents along the top to make it easier where some ballistics don't. Uh, beanies can also be a good option. I just, I just personally hate beanies. One more thing, as you get into extreme sub-zero temps, um, particularly being outside for long periods of time, face masks and skin exposure is something you wanna think about also. For long periods in sub-zero areas, I like masks that push my breath down and back into my chest to keep me warm, but you'll need to experiment on what works best for you and your body. I think that's most everything. I mean, I think there's a ton more to talk about. Oh, let's talk about footwear. Uh, first off, I don't recommend waterproof footwear at all, particularly when you're outside in a wet environment for long periods of time, because if your waterproof boots get wet on the inside from sweat or whatever else that may you know work its way in there, it will take ages and ages for them to dry. Use waterproof socks as they're a lifesaver, but have breathable boots so that moisture can wick outside of your boot and off your sock. Again, with everything we're talking about, environment and exposure duration could change what you need. Like you may need a more serious trail boot, but if you don't specifically know that you need a waterproof boot from your experience, you probably don't need it. But that's kind of my rundown on the layering system from the you know three layer and the seven layer. And the more, I think more applicable to a active civilian, two plus three or two plus four system. That means you only need a few basic things like a base layer and a waterproof layer. And the rest of it, it's pretty easy to source from other clothes that you already have. I also think the two plus system is better because it means the individual needs to be skilled. They need to know their body and their environment and their activity level, instead of just counting on expensive clothes that they bought to keep them safe and alive. I think I've kind of kick this horse to death at this point, but your knowledge of the system is gonna be far, far more valuable than a, whatever, $700 jacket. So go out and learn your body, and I challenge you to be chilly. Learn when you should vent or walk faster to regulate your temps, when you need to throw on an extra layer, and how long to wait after being active to keep from overheating. I mean, realistically though, three layers, seven layer, two plus system, it's all garbage if you don't know your own body or know how to use these systems. Let me know down in the comments, so if you kind of liked this setup that we did for this video, it's, it's kind of long, but there's a lot more I'd like to go over in terms of pant selection and, and probably pattern selection. As having military camo patterns as an active citizen probably isn't the brightest, but we could talk about that later too. But I hope this video on kind of that layering system for the prepared citizen was useful in your purchasing decisions and gave you some good ideas as to what you need. I wanna say thanks to all of our Patreon and YouTube members. You make it possible I can research all this, put it together for you, and then kind of talk about it in a smart way that you guys can digest and then go out and be better consumers and not waste money on silly things. And I want, dude, I cannot get to the end of this video. And I also wanna say thanks to everyone that likes, comments, and subscribes. Comment down below as to what your favorite base layer and waterproof layers are so that other people in the comments can get some other good ideas. I wanna hear about it too. All right, everyone, Walsh out. So I don't know where those QU attack pants went, um, but those, I'm, I'm telling you, you cannot go wrong with those. They're, they're probably my favorite. And I actually learned about those from the Seer guys. I'm like, hey, what super high-end stuff do you guys wear? Like, oh, we just wear QU. Like, I guess, well, I guess the cat's joining. Um, so yeah, I love their attack pants. They're just fantastic. Um, I do also like the Adi Gear downrange pants. Uh, they're just a little bit warm. Uh, I do wish the downrange pants had some sort of like side zips or um, like leg zips to order to take some of the different heat out. Uh, I'm very curious how many people caught on to the plate carrier that I snuck in. That'd be very interesting. All right, I, I gotta get out of here. I guess I guess this doofus decided I'm done. So go on, I gotta. 
It's a horrible day outside. It's raining and everything. All right. You guys have a good one. You got to go. You say bye to them. No, not me. You got to them. Those people. Look over there. Say bye to them. You got to say. All right. <laughs> you guys got to go. He's not. He's not going to leave. He just wants me to sit in my warm seat. Watch this. He's just going to jump in here. Watch. Is this what you want? Is this what you want right here?